Thank you, guys. I'm going to get my PowerPoint slide, please. Okay. Hello, everyone. I want to thank Clark and Labita for giving me this opportunity um, in this platform to share my story and hopefully inspire some of you with what I have to share today. So as, as they've said, my name is Brandy Remind Jewett and I am in Southern Indiana, or Washington, Indiana. And I started my business, Jewett Sports and Occupational Health or JSO in September of 2020. Um, I've been practicing athletic training for a little over five years with most of my experience, as we've said, being a clinical assistant to a chiropractor and also being a secondary school athletic trainer through employment with a local hospital. So just a bit about the grassroots of my career. In 2016, I was the first athletic trainer at a school um, that had never had an AT. So I was a brand new fresh grad at a school that had no idea what an athletic trainer was. It was far from smooth and easy. So I felt a load of responsibility from day one and was either going to break under that pressure or like so many of us do, dig my heels in and do good by my athletes, coaches and the families of the school. So I, I bring this up in the beginning to you all because looking back now, I know that my experience of, of being that epicenter of orthopedic healthcare for this school was instrumental for the trajectory of my career. Any athletic trainer who has been an AT for a high school or college here today, I invite you to truly reflect right now on how much responsibility you held or you currently hold. Like think about how many people look to you for advice, guidance, comfort sometimes or just to keep things going to keep the operations of your athletic training clinic and the athletics they're going we do so much across so many content areas and today i want to take you through my journey of building this new business in my small community i want to discuss how my experiences throughout my career prior to that has laid the perfect groundwork for my business i want to tell you what behaviors and decisions have been instrumental to my success and then how I have overcome various challenges and struggles along the way. So um, I thank you all for being here today um, to just give me the chance to share this with you. So here are the course objectives for um, this afternoon. Most of what we discussed today will simply be my journey, like me telling you my story and how I got from a year and a half ago to the place I am in now. Along the way, I'm going to discuss the most important behaviors, mindsets, and um, actions to my success. I will talk you through my challenges and the solutions I found helpful in overcoming those challenges. And then by the end of this course, I, I really hope that you all will feel encouraged, equipped, and empowered to pursue the career that excites you and provides you purpose. Okay, so let's start back at the beginning. I started my career employed by a community hospital. Through this employment, I worked with a chiropractor, and as I mentioned earlier, I provided out, outreach services to a local high school. Um, and after a couple of years, I felt stagnant with the hospital, and I felt like I didn't have a lot of room to grow professionally. Um, and this is the reason I was really quick to join the chiropractor uh, that I assisted when he opened a private clinic in 2019. In the clinic, I continued to co-treat alongside the chiropractor as before and also provided rehabilitation services, um, both cash pay and I was billing third party payers. This um, third party reimbursement through a private clinic, it was really an eye opening experience and <laughs> could really take this course down a completely different path. But for now, we will put a pin in that topic. Um, but I want you to know that me having a grasp on those details has been very beneficial, um, you know, moving forward in, into setting up my business. So along came March of 2020, and we all know that 2020 was rough, and it caused a lot of changes for many of us. And as the economic effects of the pandemic kept unfolding, I, as many athletic trainers around me, I was worried about the stability of my job at the time. I, I truly loved the work that I was doing clinically, but at the end of the day, if my employer isn't making enough to pay me, I won't have a job. So in my community, the only other established employment option for an AT 
was with the community hospital I was with before. And as I stated, when I was employed there, I just felt like I couldn't grow and I couldn't serve the way that I felt that I wanted to or that I felt led to. Um, and this is where my husband, who literally has more faith in my abilities than anyone on the planet, told me to identify what I like to do as an athletic trainer and then just do it. Simple, right? Maybe. <laughs> I have always been an employee with ideas. And at that point, I can't say that I often pursued my ideas. Knowing this, my husband pushed me to finally just do it. And he reasoned that for me, the stress of setting up a new business couldn't be near as bad as the stress of an unstable job. It couldn't be worse than working in an environment that dulls my passions and puts a cap on my abilities clinically or my abilities to serve others, and then my ability to progress financially as well. Like I felt stagnant financially um, with the hospital too. So I am, I really am grateful for my employment with the hospital, and I still have a great relationship with those I worked for and alongside, but I felt that I had more to give that was being shut down basically by organizational protocols and operations, some related to insurance too. So I knew I had a lot to give to my community, um, that lacks direct access to care. And the best way to serve, in my opinion, was to bring my services to the people. Um, something that no one else was really doing outside of uh, you know, outreach to high schools. Um, so there's so many more populations that I was seeing in my community who would benefit from better access. Uh, youth sports organizations, manufacturing companies, and, and then anyone who can't afford other options or needs to be seen sooner than the typical outpatient therapy route. So this is kind of where my heart was leading me. And honestly, I had been led towards this idea of improving access to these groups for a few years. And I really hoped or sort of banked on the hospital pursuing my ideas and making my dreams come true, so to speak. Um, and I now know that the hospital was frying bigger fish operationally than supporting and operating my new ideas. Um, but that didn't change that tug to pursue them though. So when the chiropractor started his own practice, I voiced my ideas to him and I just knew that this would be my chance to explore them and make them a reality. Now that wasn't seeming to be the case. My husband had heard countless conversations, um, he likes to call them fire sessions, <laughs> about my ideas and how I missed working with the high school athletes since moving into the private clinic um, and that I could have served them better if I only had to answer to the school admin personnel and, and not necessarily worry about the intricacies of my employment with the hospital. Um, he endured countless rants and brainstorms on how I could help out local industries and show them simple movements to prevent injuries. I mean, ATs were doing this across the state and the nation, and why won't the hospital let me do it? Why won't the chiropractor explore my plans? Um, and then again, something that my husband realized before me is that I wasn't going to let this idea go until I tried it. He also knew I was so invested, so passionate about this type of service that I wasn't going to be happy letting another organization manage me and manage the operations of my ideas. I, I was basically just sitting there waiting for somebody else to create this perfect little packaged up career setup. And instead I sat frustrated like a drenched hen when it wasn't happening. Just do it, he told me. So just identify what I wanted to do and do it. And maybe now that I'm, now I'm saying this, maybe I needed to be a feature on a Nike commercial, <laughs> but I don't know. I assure you I have no ties to Nike aside from a small obsession with their hoodies. So anyways, all of these thoughts were swirling around. Do I leave? Can I make it work? How will everyone react to me starting up a business? I'm young. I've never done this before. I was anxious and scared and excited, but I kept doing the same thing. Waking up, worried about my situation, loving what I am doing in patient care, but constantly in turmoil over the future, not taking action and just waiting for somebody else to improve my situation. So then my hours in the Cairo clinic were cut in half due to COVID and things were looking grim bills were coming due i was working 12 hours a week and that wasn't going to cut it so i actually started picking up weekend tournaments in indy which for me is about a two-hour commute and i was doing this through go for ellis now my husband works 12-hour shifts overnight so i had to come home um, and be with my two little ones each night so obviously this couldn't be a permanent arrangement but go for ellis was a godsend and kept us floating at the time 
I was wrestling with the idea of starting something on my own. Long drives actually gave me the opportunity to tune into podcasts and audiobooks about entrepreneurship and leadership and self-empowerment. Um, at, at times, I would be so pumped about everything that I could do and would iron out detail after detail on how I would operate my business, but I was doubting myself. Maybe I could convince my employer to pay me to do these things. And that's what I continued to do. And I was exhausted from dreaming. Like, have, have any of you ever been there? It's like a really frustrating spot to be in. You're like stuck in a rut with great ideas, but little faith in yourself, so there's no action. It's like a roller coaster of excitement followed by crippling self-doubt. So I just kept working and hating my situation, waiting for someone else to improve it for me. Then my spirits improved when the secondary school that I had started my career with reached out to me looking for an AT. Their, their other one had um, recently relocated. So I'm like, whoa. Not only could working with the school fill the hours I had been missing and possibly relieve me having to work weekend tourneys away from my family, I was excited to see how I could improve their services at the school by serving them directly rather than through a middle, uh, middle party employer. So it's like fate just played right into my dreams. So I signed a year long contract with the high school and was able to start just in time for their first official football practice. I was soon let go from the chiropractic, chiro chiropractic practice right after. Um, so I continued to pick up the weekend tourneys to offset my earnings. And then literally three days after football started, an HR manager from a local manufacturing company that I had um, connected with before while working with the private clinic expressed interest in my idea of on-site occupational health services or industrial services. So in casual conversation, we talked about different ways that the factory lines could be improved. Then that conversation grew to me touring the plant um, and I could offer different suggestions. So after I toured the plant, I then offered to maybe setting up a contract with me to come in and do injury prevention programming, simple treatments, um, and basically anything to help reduce their injury rates. I showed her a few articles that I had seen released by the NATA and explained how several industries across the nation are setting up programs like I was describing to her. Guys, I walked out of that plant on fire. Like, holy cow, that just happened. What have I done? I have no idea what I'm doing. What the heck? My brain was going 100 miles a minute and my heart was bursting. I now know that that feeling is what happens when you get a glimpse of your purpose. On fire is the best way that I can describe it. This is where I had a shift in my mindset, guys. I had been doing this whole dreaming thing all wrong. I expected others to create this perfect working environment, a career plan for me. I was doing all the groundwork, all of the research. I was even going to be the one providing the service in the trench, but wasn't willing to take action alone and just start my own business because it felt like a risk. It was scary, right? Like I piled on every excuse that I could to create a case against myself, against my knowledge and against my abilities. The hospital wasn't my problem. The chiropractor wasn't my problem. My problem was me. Walking out of that factory, that realization hit me. It was time to take action. So I signed a three month trial with the manufacturing company the following week to start providing on site services in September of 2020. So additionally, on top of all of that, I had a few people in the community who knew me and they knew my skill set and they were reaching out to me for advice and treatment. This was not new for me and before I would have um, had them come to see me or the chiropractor in our clinic. Well, I was no longer in the clinic. So initially I sent people to other clinicians but started hearing feedback that people trusted me and preferred to see me. So I started seeing um, friends and acquaintances and family right here in the living room. And by the end of August, I had about four people or so coming to my home for treatment every week. So um, by then I felt it was time to set up a treatment table in the front living room of my home. I threw together some intake papers and a consent form. And so there we have it. I had a sports med contract, an occupational health contract, and a cash-based clinic set up about a month after I decided to take action on my ideas. Wow, right? So I wanted to detail my origin story, if you will, with, um, with you all, because I am willing to bet that some of you have had similar beginnings, right? You have the ideas and the dreams, but you're sitting in limbo with them as you continue on keeping on. 
maybe you feel safer in that spot. But if you're anything like me, safe doesn't necessarily equal happy or fulfilled. So before I go on, I want us to really reflect on what my origin story consisted of. I had ideas to be and do better. That's where I started. I had a desire to pursue a purpose with my career. I wanted something more. I had support and encouragement from someone who knew me really well and cared about my success. And at this point, that was my husband. And then most importantly, I developed a willingness to take action. And without those four things, without those four pillars in my beginning, I wouldn't be here just a year and a half later speaking with you all. So now let's recognize what those four things or pillars of my beginning meant and did for me. I think we all have a desire to do and be better, right? Like we all want to continue improving in one way or another in our careers, friendships, families, financial statuses, et cetera. So I think most of us have this first pillar where we generate ideas and our dreams are planted. We get excited brainstorming about how things could be and what our careers could look like. When we start looking at how we are a bigger part of a whole, how our, how our work could affect our community or interact with our environment and others, that is when we develop the desire to pursue a purpose. That is when we start moving our planted dreams towards the sunlight and into rich soil. Thinking about our job becomes thinking about our life's work, and we see our work as more of a vocation and, and what we are meant to do, right? It is with this pillar that I started to think about and developing my why. Why am I here? What do I want to be in my community or for my family and for myself? How do I want to live? Purpose. So I'm going to make an assumption here and say many people like they never really determine their why. They never discover their purpose. And I highly recommend looking into the work of Ken Coleman. He's a Dave Ramsey network personality. And he wrote a book called The Proximity Principle and hosts a podcast. I have listened to the audiobook and then I religiously listened to his podcast for a few years. And I worked through his free online career clarity guide that he references often in his podcast. And I really gained more clarity on my why um, throughout my journey um, utilizing his materials. So I would be underserving you all if I didn't share these links with you. I'm not connected to Ken Coleman or the Ramsey Network in any way, aside from being a committed consumer. But if you are searching for clarity on your purpose, I highly recommend immersing yourself into this stuff. Um, and I'm not going to go crazy into crazy details on this, uh, but this step was such an important step in my journey that I have to share it in case there are some of you who haven't been exposed to this. So through his works, Ken Coleman challenges his consumers to list out skills and talents. Identify what you're good at. I am good at connecting with people. I am good at manual therapy. I am good at advocating for my patients. I am crafty and creative. I'm good at planning and hosting events. I also sing and perform. I interact well with adults and adolescents. And honestly, I think I make a mean buffalo chicken dip. <laughs> but I'm serious. I list these to show you that you should inventory all of your talents, not just those that you think are athletic training related, because all of your talents are a part of your story and they deserve to be recognized. And I think I've been able to take a lot of my talents, maybe not the buffalo chicken dip yet, and incorporated them into my business. And it really fuels me. It's fun. So after you, you list out your talents, determine what you are passionate about. I am passionate about personal growth. I am a learner and I like to continue learning new things. And I'm passionate about connection with others. Also, I am extremely passionate about athletic training and teaching others about it. I am passionate about art and expression through the arts. Um, with music or crafting. And again, I list everything because it is a part of you and it deserves to be a part of your journey to fulfillment and to your purpose. So third, I reflected on what matters to me most. Like, What is my mission? This took a while to pin down. And I actually talked about this category with my husband and my closest friends. I asked them what they thought meant most to me. And I was sort of shocked and happy to hear what they said. And while I can't say I 100% agreed with each perception of me that they expressed, their feedback brought me to my conclusion. Meaningful connections matter to me. 
if I am not bringing something important to the relationship event project or whatever it may be, I don't want to be a part of it. It sort of seems wasteful to me. And I struggle to stay committed to it. So in this category, I wrote the results that matter deeply to me are results that improve the lives of others in a meaningful way to those I am serving. To improve the lives of others in a meaningful way to those I am serving. I tell you, when I wrote that sentence out, it was like a weight had been lifted, a fog had been removed. And even saying it out loud right now, I get goosebumps because it excites me. And that's clarity, y'all. I've identified my purpose. I know my why. Okay, so back to our pillars. The next two pillars really went together for me. Without encouragement, I wouldn't have taken action. It was too scary. Encouragement helps you tackle self-doubt. It's like the extinguisher to imposter syndrome. Now, I think some point uh, or some portion of imposter syndrome is beneficial. It fosters self-reflection and can lead to pursuit of more knowledge and skills that are required for you to be successful. So self-doubt can be a healthy fuel for making smart, calculated risks. Self-doubt keeps us honest as long as we don't let that self-doubt rule our world like I did in the beginning of my career. I think imposter syndrome, when it teams up with fear and stifles action, that's when we need encouragement to then use that imposter syndrome or that self-doubt to fuel growth. So in encouragement for me, it took on different forms in the beginning. My husband's support, his faith in me, and input on my ideas and dreams, it was probably the most important in the beginning. So identify someone in your life, preferably unconnected to your workplace, who knows you well and cares about you, cares about your happiness and cares about your success. Tell them your ideas, ask for their honest input and what you are thinking about. Most importantly, don't be offended by what they have to say, but use their input to build and improve upon your ideas. For instance, I had ideas to also be a taping and bracing distributor through JSO, but when I was telling my husband about it, he thought it would be better to start with the service-based products in the beginning and that maybe being a distributor doesn't really fit with the other ideas I had. And it may even, it could assume more financial risk and be more difficult. He encouraged me to be patient with the occupational health and sports med ideas, that they would grow in time and I likely wouldn't have time for selling tangible products. I didn't like that he didn't like my idea but his perception was important. And it turns out, I, I think he was pretty right. So I also found encouragement in the podcast and leadership medias. Alicia Pennington um, with the At Vantage is another podcast person that I listen to. Um, I even interviewed her once and learned more about her story and her journey. I also looked into what other athletic trainers were doing in entrepreneurship. And I took note of the outcomes and the results of their work. What I thought fit into my world and how I could modify certain actions and ideas that they had um, to make them more of my own journey. That work is encouragement. The work within encouragement, it's crucial if you are to develop a willingness to act. Now, willingness to take action. This is the fun part, guys. This is the jumping off the cliff, diving in, all chips on the table pillar of my beginning. None of the other pillars stand or mean anything without the willingness to take action. So now I consider myself lucky in that the high school reaching out to me gave me a sense of security from which to grow from. A comfy little blanket for me to jump onto while I figured everything else out. High school athletic training, it's my comfort zone. I had been at the school, I knew the people, the administration and the community already. It was easy to take action. However, it was only half of the income that I needed. The hospital actually offered me a full-time position at the same time um, when I left the, the Cairo clinic. So I had that option in front of me and maybe they would end up for, um, provide me, providing me the platform to serve the way I wanted to pursue my ideas. But it was a tough decision. And truly, I truly think that because I had the other three pillars established and in place, I took action. I pivoted my career, I turned down employment stability to pursue lifelong fulfillment and to pursue my purpose on my own terms. Now, for those of you with an established full-time gig, maybe that can be your sense of security while you research, plan, and develop your entrepreneurial ideas. 
I am by no means suggesting suggesting that you should turn in your resignation tomorrow so you can pursue your dreams. We have to be smart about it still. What I'm saying is if you truly want to make a change, you have to start taking action now. Maybe that's to identify your purpose, identify sources of encouragement, and gain more knowledge about what other people are doing similar, similar to your business ideas. Action doesn't necessarily mean leaving your full time. So this quote, it just hits me. So I share, I'm going to share it with you guys. The true measure of a man is not what he dreams, but what he aspires to be. A dream is nothing without action. Whether one fails or succeeds is irrelevant. All that matters is that there is motion in his life. That alone affects the world. Let's sit in this for a minute. The true measure of a man is not what he dreams, but what he aspires to be. A dream is nothing without action. Whether one fails or succeeds is irrelevant. All that matters is that there is motion in his life. That alone affects the world. So I learned more about myself. I sought encouragement. I took action. Talking about all of this to you guys right now, it sounds so perfect and uplifting and nice and cozy. Well, I was fulfilled and purposeful and moving in the right direction. This is the best visual I can create for you all on what September 2020 looked like for me. I don't know who this woman is in this picture, but I can feel her struggle. I had a purpose and I had lots of opportunities to pursue that purpose. I was taking action forward but I didn't have stability or a solid direction. I didn't even know what to do to find stability and direction. I was just showing up, working hard, and drowning my eardrums with podcasts and inspirational speakers on entrepreneurship to keep myself from giving up. And honestly, the podcast, you know, listening to people who had similar beginnings to me um, that made it out with multi-million dollar companies, those stories, they gave me hope and encouragement and taught me to trust myself. They gave me the will to keep treading the water of my brand new business. And most of all, they made me realize that I needed help. I needed resources. All of these stories, every entrepreneur that had made it out and been successful, they sought out the appropriate resources and they leaned on others um, in their field to make it happen. So this is where Clark came in. Clark and I, um, as we mentioned before, met through his service to the Indiana AT Association. Um, as a consult for third party reimbursement. And I was connected with him when we were setting up reimbursement for me in the private clinic. He hadn't heard from me in a while, so he reached out to inquire about a few things we were working on um, with Anthem Insurance, I believe. And well, when he called, I unloaded all of the events from the past few months and um, talked about my ideas, what was already in place, and that I didn't know if it was going to work because I was lost, overwhelmed, and unsure. Um, we probably talked for two to three hours, mostly comprised of me pacing through my home and emotions and thoughts while Clark patiently listened, offered encouragement and advice. Lots of useful and specific advice. Let's write a business plan. Do you have an attorney? Does your accountant know what you're doing? What are you calling your business in? Do you have a DBA certificate? What about standing orders? Um, he was speaking a different language for most of the conversation, I think. Um, and while that conversation was adding more items to the I don't know what this is list and honestly made me feel more overwhelmed at moments throughout the conversation, I started to feel like Clark could give me some direction. And in the following days, we spoke almost daily as I worked through some of the important first steps of starting a business. My trust in Clark grew as I learned more about his past experiences in business and began to feel that he was invested in my success and not his personal gain. And reflecting back, it is incredibly important that as you start a business, that you find someone with experience in what you are wanting to do, but that you feel comfortable with and trust them. Find your navigator. And maybe that isn't a person and it's a podcast or inspirational speaker at first, or um, maybe it's a combination of resources in the beginning like it was for me, but seek it out. That's part of your action. While you're in your full time and you've got these ideas, seek out the information while you've got the stability. Um, and certainly, obviously, Clark is a great place to start. So before anything else, I recommend putting together a business plan, especially if you have a stable full-time job. Develop this before you leave that full-time gig, if possible. This will be the map that guides you through decisions, operations, and growth of your business. 
working through a business plan template helped me think about aspects of a business that I didn't even know existed. At first, it was very intimidating. And honestly, I felt overwhelmed most of the time. But it is much better to be overwhelmed while planning than to be surprised and taken off guard when you are out doing your business. So there's another course on putting together a business plan that you can find in the Boat Academy course library. For those, again, for those of you currently working full time, this is a great chance for you to brainstorm, collect information, and iron out the details of your business while you have the stability of your job. Figure out if it's even going to work financially or in your market. The first thing, um, the first thing that you need is a foundation from which to grow and branch out from. This is your vision, your vision statement, mission statement, and your core values. These three sections of the business plan will be the guiding light for decisions and behaviors within your business. The business plan will also identify action steps that need taken care of and will help you make more informed decisions. So do yourself a favor and get working on this right away. I suspect that many of you already have the information that um, needs to go into a business plan. You just haven't written it all down and organized your ideas. So reach out to Clark or myself or someone else you trust or um, definitely take the business plan uh, boat academy course if you need help getting started with this it's seriously important and it turned out to be pretty fun and fueling to my excitement for jso so definitely recommend starting there so when working with clark to put together my business plan i was faced with accompl accomplishing things right away and this is by no means an exhaustive list of the things i was facing um, that contributed to me feeling like i was drowning but these are the primary topic areas I feel demanded most of my attention when I started. Also, they, like, if I'm being completely honest, they lent to most of my initial struggles. I started to realize that starting my own business seemed incredibly complex and I felt overwhelmed and um, discouraged. And honestly, at times I felt like a fool for thinking that I could even do this. I was frustrated that I couldn't just jump in and treat and, you know, just do the clinical stuff. Why does this have to be so hard? And looking back though, the most difficult challenge for me in the beginning was me. Me complaining and whining and freaking out. It takes a lot of energy to do that, guys. And like I said before, it's okay to have self-doubt. It's okay to feel underqualified, but do something about it. Because once I just started chipping away at these things and getting my hands in these seemingly complicated tasks, it wasn't that hard at all. I encourage you all to look at this list as just that. It's a to-do list of tasks that need completed. When I took everything one at a time, it was easy to manage and actually cool to learn more about the behind the scenes aspects of business and healthcare. Um, so in, in the pursuit of figuring all of these things out, Clark was instrumental and I'm not gonna lie, it was scary to trust someone that I didn't really know with all of my ideas. And, and I'd say finding this type of person isn't easy, but there are things to look for when you're deciding to trust in someone with the knowledge, um, to gain the knowledge that you need. So from a leadership course I have taken in the past, I learned that followers were those following, those following those who lead. They require above all else, trust, compassion, stability, and hope. And so I took these things and, and kind of, reflected on my relationship with Clark up until that point. To follow where Clark was leading me, I needed to trust him. He expressed compassion for how COVID had affected the trajectory of my career and compassion for the incredibly hard work that I was putting in between getting a business going, raising two tiny humans, and being away from my family every weekend just to keep bills paid. But he offered me hope and that I could do this. I can make this work. And I realized that I could achieve more stability if I could trust where he was leading me. From October to December, I didn't pay a cent for his help. I think, I think what that showed me is that he trusted my abilities and he trusted that his investment of time in me was going to be worth it. And that's pretty powerful, y'all. Like looking back, I think his trust and my husband's trust in me, it fueled me through the three hours of sleep per night and the relentless work that I was putting in. He kept the human in what I was doing. And that is the type of support you guys need. And it's out there. Next, I'm going to, um, I'm going to provide details of how I navigated each of these steps here on this slide. 
and I will outline the challenges, mistakes, and the lessons through each task. It's important to realize, though, that these are not, I'm not going through these in any particular order, and many things were being accomplished simultaneously. So keep that in mind as we dig deeper into these. Having an attorney early on in the development of your business, it's really beneficial. Looking back, um, I actually wish I would have involved in a, an attorney earlier, like right when I was entertaining my ideas. Um, they will be able to bring things to your attention that you maybe wouldn't think about otherwise. For instance, my attorney requested a copy of my employment agreement from the chiropractic office and from the hospital that I was employed by prior to him. I didn't have copies of those things. <laughs> Should have kept copies of them, but now I know. Anyways, she wanted to review the agreements and make sure there weren't any clauses or limits within the agreements that would be violated by me starting up my own business. So even if you think that your prior employer has no interest in enforcing these limits, or maybe they don't even know that they would apply to your business, you want to be informed and prepared. If she had reviewed my employment agreement, I had them, um, and found concern, she would have written up a release form or clarification form um, for my prior employer to sign stating that he basically wouldn't pursue any legal action against me or my business. So, and additionally, there are other things along the way that either required or benefited from having my attorney look it over or be involved. Um, and I will mention a few of these things in later slides, but overall, her involvement in the startup of my business gives her an understanding of the direction of my business and like where it might go and then how she can support me then, now, and in the future. So for me, I really wanted to do things the right way simply because it's the right thing to do. So having my attorney is a way to ensure that I am operating legally um, and then in my best interest. So guys, you don't realize that you don't have to be an expert in everything related to your business. I think the wisdom is really you just need to know when to rely on other experts for some things. So in choosing my attorney, I wanted someone who knew healthcare policies and laws, and I wanted my attorney to understand the dynamics and context of the community I would be serving. My attorney is local to the area. She's familiar with athletic training um, and then healthcare provider scope of practice. And she also represents other healthcare and wellness businesses in town. So I, I trusted her um, to help me navigate the legalities of the business that I was setting up. So I know that this slide looks aggressive, but seriously, guys, you should all have some sort of liability insurance. Every healthcare provider providing hands-on treatment and medical advice to patients across all fields should pay for liability insurance, and athletic trainers are no exception. I know many ATs who simply don't want to pay for it and you know, don't see the need. Like, the likelihood of someone suing me is low because I treat patients right. That is a true statement until it is not. Liability insurance is there to fund you proving that you are treating within your scope and doing right by your patients. Other comparable clinicians purchase their own um, liability insurance most of the time outside of what their employer provides. So PTs and OTs, for example. And I think AT should as well, especially since we deal with emergency care more often than those other comparable fields. Um, but again, that topic could bring us into the weeds. So let's circle back. Um, I called Mercer for Pro Liability, which is the company that um, the NATA lists. And I've been really happy with their customer service. And I had my attorney review the policy to make sure that I was covered in the context of the business I plan to run. Also, they provide coverage for any subcontractors under JSO, um, so long as they're listed on my policy. And the price of that policy didn't change much when I added um, the subcontractors. So that was pretty nice. Bottom line, Nothing will stop your operations, your dreams, your aspirations more suddenly than a lawsuit that you are not prepared to defend yourself against. So um, there are also there's other companies that will be cheaper as well. I suggest speaking to an attorney or uh, maybe Clark can answer questions or point you in the, the right direction. If you are wanting something more cost effective than Mercer, um, I've never looked at anything else. But look at this as an investment in your career, an investment into your business. It's just something that you should have regardless of your entrepreneurial ideas or not. I also suggest before diving deep into planning the operations of your business, you need to fully understand your scope of practice. This means knowing what your state does and does not allow and knowing what you individually can and can't do. 
For instance, in Indiana, I can basically do everything that I am trained to do so long that I have standing orders um, to do so. For me, this means I can do everything I learned in my AT bachelor's program and the extra certifications and training I have gone through. So I can provide evaluation, rehab, emergency care of injuries, and Graston and dry needling. So if you are in Indiana, but haven't gone through dry needling training, obviously you haven't been trained to do it, so you can't do it. Um, or maybe you have gone through a dry needling certification course, but your overseeing physician specifically states no dry needling on your standing orders, then you can't provide this service. Um, I go into these painful details to make sure that you guys understand the importance of understanding your scope. Because the better you understand it, the better you can communicate your scope of practice to others. Maybe it's patients, um, potential employees, uh, potential directing physician. Knowing your scope can also help you identify patients or customers who will benefit from your services or who can um, help refine what services you are going to provide as part of your business. Being able to communicate my scope of practice has come in handy for me on more than one occasion. So make sure you have a good grip on your state's unique scope. And I believe that there is a course, um, it's taught by, yeah, it's taught by Brian Hortz on the Boat Academy Library listed on this slide that discusses scope of practice. Um, I haven't taken it, but I know Brian really well and he's really good. So I know personally that my undergraduate program went through scope of practice, but that topic didn't resonate with me as much as it does now that I'm practicing. So I really recommend taking that course. So after unpacking my journey to Clark, he identified that most of my success was coming from meaningful relationships that I had already established, right? So therefore, we discussed how it was important for people to immediately associate my business name and logo with me, with Brady Jewett. So I, it needed to include my name because that was important to my consumers. Um, we also needed people to have a good idea of what my business does. The word health, resonated with me um, and my purpose, and I wanted it to be in the name of my business. Thus, Jewett Sports and Occupational Health encompasses who I am and what I'm doing. It was long though, pretty long business name. Hence, we have JSO, which is an acronym that Clark suggested. Boom, business name, it's real. <laughs> so something you should think about when coming up with a business name um, and when marketing your business is a concept I picked up from Dave Ramsey's book on trade leadership. Consumers don't care what your product or service is as much as they care about what it does for them. So people need to know what it is, of course, but how your service will affect them is much more important. The service is injury evaluation, treatment, and rehabilitation in general. But what my business does is prevent injuries, empower with knowledge, and help people perform their work and sport, all in an effort to improve their quality of life. So um, because of that, I added the tagline, preserve, empower, and perform. Now I actually have two friends who have started their own businesses after me, and I'll be honest, I'm obsessed with their business names. So Stephanie Wise, um, one of my classmates from the DAT program, started a business out of her home that's similar to the cash-based uh, clinic division of JSO. And her passion is in really in educating others about their healthcare. Her business name is Health Wise and I love it. Tremendous use of her name and her purpose to help convey what her business does. You take a step further and her logo is an owl, her son's favorite animal and a, a symbol of wisdom. And I'm a sucker for connections like that. Her name, what she does, and a pinch of family. It is a solid face of her business. Um, I've got another friend, Kim Bacala, also from the DAT program. She focuses on those athletes who are released from physical therapy, but still not quite back to their full selves and need more functional care to get them back to full go. Her business name is Full Go, and she utilizes a neon purple wolf in her logo. The neon purple look to her logo reflects her personality, um, just like the owl in Healthwise reflects Stephanie's. And then the wolf uh, represents loyalty and teamwork seen in a pack. It takes teamwork, between clinician and patient to truly have a meaningful result. Now, while I can't say that my logo and business name reflect much of my personality compared to these two, my consumers are different than theirs. In my community, my name is what has carried my success in all three divisions of JSO. I am involved in many things in my community. So many people seeking care in my clinic already know me well enough to trust me with their care. 
don't get me wrong, I'm obsessed with how cool these women and their business names are, and maybe someday I'll do a rebrand to reflect more of my personality. Um, but it wasn't something, that connection that they're making with their logo wasn't something that was as important to my consumers as it may be to Stephanie and Kim's. So their main targets are individual patients seeking someone they trust, many people that they don't know. My cash-based clinic is the majority of people I already know, and then my industrial and sports med clients are less concerned with the feels of my service and more concerned with my skills, knowledge, and business practices. They want to know how my services will be a good investment, not rather I make them feel good, right? So in essence, your name and your logo should be unique to you, unique to the services that you provide, and unique to what those services do, and unique to the people that you hope to to um, provide them to. So once you've decided a business name, you'll need to fill out and obtain a DBA or a doing business as certificate, which basically ties your name and your social security number to your business name. I wish I would have done this from the very beginning. It would have made a few things easier. For instance, if someone writes you a check to your business rather than your name and you don't have a DBA, you can't cash the check. That was frustrating for the first month and a half or so because I had all my clients write checks to do sports and occupational health and I didn't have a DBA so I didn't get those funds um, until I filed the DBA. Talk about cash flow problems. Now it seems really obvious and embarrassing that I didn't know that but I didn't so I am sharing it as maybe some of you don't know that either. Um, you also need the DBA when you go to open a business checking account. Um, I would do the DBA as early as you can. It should be uh, one of your first actions, in my opinion. I did all of this through our county courthouse too, so I assume that's um, pretty common for everybody else as well. While I am now an LLC, I didn't initially set that up. From August to March, I was just filing as a sole proprietor with just the DBA to represent me and JSO. When speaking to my accountant and attorney, they inform me that the LLC will only protect me from things that my employees or contractors working on behalf of JSO do. My professional liability insurance will protect me from things that I do. Meaning, if I am the only person working as JSO, I did not technically need to LLC. Additionally, not having an LLC with what I was doing at first would not change my tax filing tasks at all. It wasn't a benefit or, or not a benefit either way. So with that information, um, I decided to wait until I had the need for an LLC for a couple of reasons. It made me feel like I was taking less of a risk. I don't know why, like committing but not filing that LLC right away gave me a sense that I could go back if I needed to or if I ended up not liking running the business. So I sat with the DBA and allotted more time um, to my business operations. However, in March, I knew that I was wanting to bring on subcontractors. So I notified my attorney and had her prepare the LLC for me. Now, I know several people have done this without the help of an attorney, and I honestly have no idea what the pros and cons are with that. So I would just make sure that you are fully informed on what it takes to do that on your own versus going through an attorney um, and make the decision that's best for you and that's best for the type of work that you're doing. Subscribing to a good accounting software is incredibly important. I use QuickBooks Self-Employed. It is completely cloud-based. It tracks my mileage automatically um, through the app on my phone and has a lot of reporting options. Only $15 a month and actually has more features than I use, um, such as sending invoices and receiving payments. The payment processing and invoicing platform, it really isn't ideal for what I'm doing as all of my clients send paper checks rather than digital. Um, and it really isn't designed for quick payments from customers like I would need in the clinic. So I'll be honest though, if QuickBooks didn't track my mileage, my mileage probably wouldn't be tracked at all. Um, I'm just too busy for it. Um, and for my business where I bring services to most of my consumers, I do a lot of driving. I would be missing out, I, I think when I looked yesterday, I'd be missing out on around $7,000 um, of, of write offs come tax season. So that's super helpful and it's obviously worth it. QuickBooks also has a feature where it links your business bank account and will automatically save transactions over into QuickBooks. Um, and it kind of guesses on the business category. 
I have that turned off. If you don't keep up with assigning the transactions to the right category, it gets really overwhelming. So I physically print my bank statement and then post everything from my bank statement into QuickBooks Monthly. Um, when I first started though, there is another um, app out there called Expensify. It's actually a free mobile app where you can take pictures of receipts um, and track transactions and mileage like you can on QuickBooks, but you have to be on top of it. Um, and it isn't quite as intuitive in my opinion. It also doesn't have the same reports that QuickBooks has, um, but it was the right decision for me to get started because it helped me learn what I needed and wanted to set up once I started using QuickBooks. So um, Expensify is a really good option for you as well. I would also open a business banking uh, bank checking account fairly soon. Um, I don't know how I could actually keep track of everything if I didn't use, if I didn't have my spending and income separated from my personal account. Um, that it was kind of a nightmare in the beginning trying to do that. So I only use my business debit card for business related purchases. No matter what, hands down, only business expenses come from um, that business account. So then all of JSO income runs through the business account as well, uh, with the exception of Venmo, which I'll talk about in a second. But by doing this, I have a record of all expenses and income related to JSO that I can now use to log into QuickBooks. So with each transaction on QuickBooks, I can assign a category, um, office supplies, utilities, advertising, gas and fuel, um, the list goes on. And I then take it for reporting purposes, I take it a step further and I tag each transaction based on what part of JSO it's related to. Um, for instance, if I received payment from my high school contract, I log the transaction as income and then I tag it sports medicine and then I tag the school. So if I'm logging income from my cash-based clinic, I log it as income, but then tag individualized care clinic. Same for expenses. So um, you know, if I buy more emollient for my clinic, I will log it as rehab and treatment supplies and then tag it as clinic. This takes discipline. And it took a lot of discipline in the beginning when cash flow was complicated and quite frankly, really low. <laughs> but do yourself a favor and I really recommend following that guideline because now I am able to look back on the past year and see exactly how much I spent and made for each division and each client of JSO. For instance, say I made $7,500 from the clinic last quarter and I spent $1,500 on supplies for the clinic. I can get a rough estimate that I made a profit of about $5,900 from the clinic. So that specific figure then allowed me to make a calculated decision to lease an office space in town. So the rent of my new space is going to be $700 a month. And because of the report I described, I know that I can afford it and still make a profit um, if I continue to see the same amount of patients per month. So I am so, so glad that I started grouping things like this from the beginning because it gives me an idea of what the business is and can do as I grow and move forward. Um, I also recommend either notifying your accountant that you plan to start a business, or if you don't have a CPA, find one that people you know and trust use and are happy with. Um, in my experience, when things are done right the first time, it saves me a lot of time in the future. Um, as you guys can probably pick up on, I'm quite busy with the clinical and admin tasks of what I do through JSO. So when I run into an admin snag, perhaps from categorizing expenses correctly or, or forgetting to track my mileage, it feels like a dumpster fire in the middle of my week. And if you deal, deal through an accountant, they can make sure that you are tracking things correctly um, and allocating transactions the way that you should be from the start and maybe even take some of those tasks from you. So um, I, I've talked to many new entrepreneurs who are confident that they can handle all of their accounting on, and tax filing on their own. Um, and maybe they can, I can't. And I caution you against being too confident, thinking that you already know all that there is to know about it. Because if you approach things this way, you are setting yourself up vulnerable to dumpster fires that will be much more difficult and sometimes more costly um, to fix compared to paying an expert on the topic um, that can direct you in a way that prevents these problems. So remember, you don't have to be an expert in every task related to your business. You just have to be wise enough to know when to rely on others for tasks that um, you are not as well versed in. 
setting my fee schedule. So this is another topic that Clark guided me through. The truth is your fees for whatever service you are providing is going to be extremely dependent on your community and the market you will be targeting and serving. The first thing you have to consider is that if people can't afford it, they won't pay you, period. It doesn't matter how much they need or want the service or product you are selling. If it isn't in their pocket, it won't end up in yours. So you've got to ask yourself, what can your consumers pay? Next, you have to identify what people are willing to pay. At the same time, you need to figure out what your time is worth to you. Now, for me, this was, it seemed very complex and it required a lot of reflection, math, and consideration. And I am no finance expert, but I can explain to you what I did in the beginning to get an idea of what my time should be worth. Um, so to figure out my time, what, is, what, what I needed it to be worth, I sat down and I looked at my personal finances. I determined how much we needed an in income to just pay our bills and live for a month. I found out what that number was. I subtracted my husband's income from that to figure out how much income I would need to bring in to just live day to day and to get all of our bills paid. That number was what I had to bring in or the business wasn't going to work. We were very diligent in not taking out business loans for this. Um, so then my husband and I listed what sort of financial goals we had how much we um, would like to make bare minimum to save or invest or pay down our, on our debt per year. We wrote that number down. Then I took that number um, and figured out what I would need to make to, to get our ideal annual salary. So those two numbers were my range. Lower number was what I needed to bring in to survive. Higher number was what I needed to bring in to be as comfortable as we wanted. So the clinic wasn't guaranteed income, right? Like I cannot guarantee how many people are going to schedule an appointment with me. That stressed me out. So in the beginning, I focused on the contracts or the more secured income and getting that to equal my survive number. If I can get a monthly income from clients to equal my survive number, then everything outside of that will just be extra. So the school contract was agreed upon in a haste and based upon my um, hourly wage in the beginning for my uh, for my previous employment and it was only 20 hours a week so while it was secured it wasn't enough to meet my survive number and I needed more per month so I had all of these numbers and thoughts with me when I went to speak with my first industrial client they had around 100 employees and based on research in industrial medicine 100 employees should have two to four hours per week of preventative care to see a meaningful positive return so when I divided what I needed to add to my income to meet my survive number by four hours per week that came to a little more than $100 per hour at four hours per week. Um, so basically I ran all of this math by Clark um, and he has experience and contacts in the industrial field and he thought it sounded fair, so we decided that it was. So when I pitched four hours a week, $100 per hour to my first client, they thought it sounded fair, voila, I can survive. <laughs> $100 an hour then became my set rate for industrial clients. So I had to set my fees for the clinic. Initially, I looked around what other similar services were costing people in my community um, through the lens of the consumer. And I need to say that one again because it's important. Through the lens of the people handing over their money, I fit my services somewhere in between massage therapists and chiro clinics. I emphasize that because it doesn't matter how much I think my services are worth if the consumer isn't willing to pay it. So massage therapists around here charge about a dollar a minute and chiros are anywhere from $20 to $150 per visit. So I decided to stick with that a dollar a minute as it was easy to communicate to patients and it felt like a good start. Massage therapists are also crazy busy around here so I knew that patients could afford that. Um, and another thing to consider is most patients have $20 to $50 copay for PT with visits ranging from 30 to 45 minutes. And most of my visits are 15 to 30 minutes. So this consideration also made my a dollar a minute fee schedule make pretty good sense. Um, so I realized that I had the ability to come up with all of this on my own, right? But having Clark there to hear my thoughts, to hear my process, and to confirm that my way of thinking made sense, that was really important for me. Encouragement, right? Um, so now uh, in the past July, I was talking to Clark about growth in the clinic and how I was scheduling out a couple weeks and the industrial and sports med schedule was getting in the way of me seeing more patients. Um, however, I wasn't making more from industrial, uh, I, I was making more from the industrial per hour than in the clinic. So it didn't make sense 
to scale back industrial at all in the future. Like that's where most of my growth needs to be. Um, so basically I saw a conflict between these two divisions of JSO. Additionally, I had just completed a dry needling course and would be offering this new service to patients and therefore would be having higher clinic expenses from having to buy needles. Clark suggested that this was probably a time, um, a good time to raise my fees and to maybe ma make it match my industrial fees. So $100 per hour or $25 per 15 minutes. So I go through, I go through all of that thought process to maybe stimulate this similar thinking in whatever your guys' ideas are. Um, it, it wasn't just a on the whim, oh, I'd like to make $100 an hour, so that's what's going to be. There was some calculations that, that were into play and some reflection that went into it um, that, that kind of, it took in a lot of different stakeholders, my patients, me, and what other people are doing. So I hope by hearing that part of my journey, you guys can kind of see how um, involved that decision was, but that at the end of it, when I look back, it was really pretty simple. So in Indiana, we must have written, written standing or direct orders from a directing physician to practice within our skills and knowledge. For me, I knew I wanted to have someone who would agree to oversee the high school, industrial sites, and the clinic. Um, I was actually familiar with a surgeon practicing in a neighboring county who we had sent workers, uh, workers' compensation cases to in the past. So for the chiropractic practice, I was usually the one preparing notes and documentations uh, documentation needed for referrals, and I knew their office staff pretty well. They've got a pretty robust workers' compensation um, billing department. So I decided one day to be super assertive and brave and called his office to ask to speak directly to him. His staff set up a call with me later that week, and we chatted for about an hour about his background, my background, my aspirations for JSO, um, and the direction that he was wanting his practice to go and then what I would need from him if he were to agree to be my physician. So while I know that went much smoother for me than many other AT entrepreneurs I've met, I want to focus in on why I think I was successful. Um, prior to calling him, I made a list of physicians that I knew that I had a decent relationship with. And most importantly, I only listed providers who I believe practiced in a way that aligned with my values and my needs. I was wanting to serve industrial and sports med contracts. So ideally, I would want a physician who may find those aspirations as intriguing at minimum. Um, I knew he had a great biller and coder in his office that was pleasant to work with. So that was going to make it easier on the companies that I am serving. Um, and then contacts of mine were pleased with his care and always had good feedback. So while him providing me orders wasn't going to mean he was going to get any referrals from me, I was being very clear about that. The kind of person and kind of doctor he was meant a lot to me. So automatically a conversation with someone who seems aligned with my values and beliefs, it's going to be a lot easier than someone who is not. Um, second, I knew what I needed from him before I went into the conversation. I took time to research my state practice, practice act um, before calling his office. I also listened to Alicia Pennington's podcast on establishing physician direction and I took notes. The physician is not held liable for anything that I may do. Many physicians have that concern when ATs approach them, I think, um, that their liability insurance will not cover the ATs practice, and it won't. However, providing standing orders does not make them responsible for any acts of malpractice. That's what our AT liability insurance is for. So um, I think a good example of this is physical therapy. A physician will write an order for physical therapy, the PT will see a patient, and the PT practices um, if they practice outside of their skills and scope of practice, the PT is held liable, not the ordering physician. So, um, you know, if physicians are, are not are likely not going to take time to research that when deciding to be your overseeing physician, um, so you will have to accept that you must do that for them. If they say they want to check with their liability insurance provider before giving you orders, just ask who their provider is and offer to call the customer service number um, of their provider and find out the info for them. This is going to show that you are serious about your business plan and willing to take um, that work off of their plate. If any of you are stuck at this stage, please reach out to me or Clark or, um, you know, listen to the podcast content Alicia Pennington has and, and they can help. We all can help you navigate that challenge. Um, so anyways, the doc agreed to be my overseeing physician and I told him I would send him the orders I needed signed by the end of the following week because that's when I started with the industrial client. So you can see how things just kind of fall into place um, in my journey so far. 
I'm going to be completely honest. Clark has done all of my contracts and I really don't desire to be any other way. I just don't think I'm very good at it. Um, he puts things together based on the situation or the need. I review it. I provide my feedback and he provides feedback on my feedback and we go back and forth until we like it. We send that on to the necessary stakeholder and we go from there. So whether it be my standing orders, a subcontractor agreement, or contracts with my industrial sports med clients, I do not even know where to start without the templates and guidance that Clark has provided. So if your business is something where a contract is needed, I strongly advise just reaching out to other people doing similar things that you want to do and see if they can either provide you a template or an outline of how to um, structure that contract. So once again, I reiterate, you do not have to be an expert at everything your business needs. You just have to be wise enough to seek out the necessary resources and outsource the tasks when needed. Okay. So here is what I felt like immediately after Clark started helping me and we took care of our first steps. I'm still working hard and I wouldn't say that everything was super easy, but at least in this picture, I have a boat, a compass and a life raft in case I stumble out of the boat into the deep waters. Um, my early interactions with Clark, a mentor experienced in business and in athletic training was crucial. Most importantly, it was available along with other resources. All of these resources are available for you too. Okay, time to reflect again. There are some important aspects in my early beginning that enabled me to accomplish so much so quickly, ultimately leading to my success so far. First and foremost, I recognized and accepted that I couldn't do all of this by myself. I needed to seek counsel with other people doing similar things as me. Maybe eventually I could figure it out, but I promise you, I wouldn't be doing this well without the stories, advice, and guidance from Clark and other ATs and entrepreneurs. I actively sought out resources and advice outside of myself, outside of my circle, and most importantly, outside of my comfort zone. Recognize that not all of my resources were one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. Don't get me wrong, Clark and other people are big players in my success. But if you feel like you don't have someone that you can trust to be your Clark, or you aren't interested in working with him or someone like him right away, recognize that I got a lot of information from podcasts, courses in the Boat Academy library, and simply researching other successful entrepreneurs' um, origin stories. So basically your excuse of, I don't know, or trust anyone who can help me, it's not gonna work here. That's you using an escape and you aren't ready if that is your mindset. You also aren't ready if you are sitting here thinking that you have all of the knowledge that you need to make this work. We are all better when growing together, no matter what your stage in your career, no matter what stage in your career that you are in. Two heads are better than one. Why reinvent the wheel? All of those things. Bottom line is we need each other and to take input from each other if we are going to be our best selves. And I'm not saying that you will take every piece of advice or resource that you're exposed to, but you will use it in one way or another. I have used everything I have learned to shape the career that I want for my community and for myself. And that doesn't mean that I'm doing things exactly how others are, but rather I am taking all of this info to mold my business into what works best for me um, and what works best for my community and my market. So recognize that you should not and probably cannot do this alone. Honestly, being alone is boring and sad anyways, and you can be better than that. So. A third thing, commit to falling up. This is a mindset mindset shift, y'all. I even use this phrase with my kiddos. So Connor, if you're going to fall, fall up. If you ask, Connor will tell you, he's my four-year-old, he will tell you that that means every time we fall, there is something to be learned so that we can do better next time. If Connor trips over a toy that he left out in the middle of his room, he has now learned that if he doesn't want to fall again, he should put his toy away after he was using it rather than leaving it out instead of falling on the floor and crying about falling down, which is our first instinct, right? We don't want to feel sorry for ourselves when things don't go right. A good example is I pitched industrial services to a client I thought would be extremely interested in what I had to offer. Great relationship with the safety manager, and we had a great conversation about a potential contract. He said no. Move on to the next company. No. And the next one. No. That stings, guys. Let me paint you a picture of my life back then. One industrial client, four hours a week. I was at the high school. I was seeing three to four patients a week. That still didn't bring in enough for us to reach our survive number and pay our bills comfortably. 
So I was still doing the um, go for Ella shifts every Friday to Saturday. That is a two hour commute one way. My husband works 12 hour shifts overnight. So most of the time I was driving home after um, the shift each day to care for, to care for and stay with my then one year old and three year old. Exhaustion doesn't even begin to cover it guys. So when they were saying no, after no, after no, I was discouraged, barely paying my bills, exhausted. I found my will to commit to falling up as I have taught my son. I reflected on why these companies were telling me no. Each industry has its own unique needs and reasons for turning down my service, but I wouldn't have been able to list those out. I had no idea why they said no. I just know they said no and it made me upset. So I reached back out to the three of them and I asked them what was holding them back from working with me. In short, they didn't feel like they needed the service and they explained why. So while I may have disagreed with them, if they don't perceive that they need it, I need to find someone that does and that's where I need to spend my time. So from all of those no's, I changed my mindset. I learned more about why I fell down and why they told me no. And I viewed the experience as a learning opportunity. I need to talk to people who need me, companies who have a lot of injuries and no one to care for them. A month after this realization, I started a pilot with a turkey processing plant. Point being, when things go wrong, maybe you need to change your mindset. Accept that you will have more no's than yes sometimes and welcome them, welcome the no, welcome the failure. Because when you do that, you welcome the growth. You will gain a tremendous more amount of information and lessons from a no or from falling up than you will ever um, from a yes. Lastly, here it is, guys. You gotta take action. That whole spiel on the other three themes here are pointless if you aren't willing to take action. Sound familiar? Recognize that you don't have all the information to do this alone. Find successful experts in business and in what you are wanting to do. Seek out the necessary resources, commit to falling up and learning from the disappointments along the way, and be willing to take action on those lessons. So this is what I feel like now. I'm 15 months into my business journey. I feel like I'm in control of my life, my finances, my career, my passions, and my future. I won't lie to you, I still work like a dog. I put in more hours for my career than I ever have in, in my life. Um, so, you know, every action I take in my life now contributes to the beating heart of my purpose and my why that makes it worth it. So I use now I use my vision statement, my mission statement and core values developed for my business plan to ground my decisions um, and my accounting reports to guide decisions. Every decision is calculated and the risks are weighed, both financial risks and risks associated with tangible things like how the decision will affect my family. Is it aligned with my vision and my core values? Does it fit in? So here's a look at the growth I have seen um, since I started last year. You know, in September, I had a secondary school with a one-year contract and a three-month trial with one occupational site and several patients in my cash-based clinic. JSO has grown the secondary school contract to a three-year, um, which also increased the yearly compensation quite a bit. I've ex also expanded the service line. I've teamed up with another local high school where I provide a two-hour injury check every week. And I have a one-year contract with my first occupational client. And I've started the, we're still in that pilot program with the second one. My cash-based clinic has grown from three to five patients a week in August. Now I'm seeing about 16 to 20. And I will be actually moving into a clinic out of my living room on our residential property into a recently acquired office space on Main Street in Washington. So Guys, I'm, I'm still in shock about a lot of this, I think. Um, seriously, even though I was digging in, putting in the work and committed to JSO like I did, I didn't believe that this is where I would be. My primary challenge right now is needing more team members. Um, you know, as successful as I am, I'm not without challenges. I need more clinicians to help provide the services JSO offers if I'm going to grow beyond where I'm at right now. So. Um, I've been working with Clark on recruiting, um, finding the right team member. You know, I really want to find people who are going to exemplify and, and reflect the work and the values and stuff that I've put into JSO. Um, and as can be expected, I'm working a 16, 60 plus hours week, uh, 60 plus hours a week. So keeping my work and personal life balance, it, it's a constant struggle and it's, it's currently a struggle. While I've never struggled more with this than right now, Work-life balance has always been a hot topic for our profession, right? Um, so I can't say I've ever had a good one. 
but at any point, the freedom with this, at any point, I can decide to drop the drop any part of my job, right? Like I'm in control of my career now. Um, so while I'm still struggling to balance my work and life responsibilities, I'm in control of it. Um, so there is some some freedom in that. Another challenge is managing the growth of all three divisions. As I kind of mentioned before, there is a tug from one, right? Like growth in one um, division of JSO. So growth in the clinic is going to take away from the sports med. The growth in the sports med is going to take away from the industrial. There's only so many hours of daylight in a day. Um, so I, I do think a lot of these challenges can be solved by having more team members, which is something, again, at the beginning of this, I never thought that I would be discussing. So, yep, these are things that Clark and I are, are currently working through. So, in summary, if you guys just take one sentence away from this, you can do this, right? Reflect through these pillars and behaviors I've discussed and realize that I am nothing special, guys. I'm an athletic trainer with big ideas, big passions, a little bit of money, and then endless resources. I decided to take action towards the seemingly more difficult path instead of staying in my comfort zone of employment. I changed my mind, guys, and it starts there. It doesn't end there, though. Every decision I have made is calculated based on the resources available to me and the advice of people who have done similar things before. I have not done this on my own. I even, I shy away from people congratulating me on all that I'm doing and have accomplished because I don't feel like I deserve all of the congrats, right? Like I'm only a part of this. Sure, my name is on the business, my face and my skills are the main driver. And believe me, I know that I've put in the work, but other people are responsible for this success. The most important thing that I did for this success was to take action. I activated the idea and have committed to the pursuit of JSO's success. I take it day by day, decision by decision, and I rely on the input of Clark, my husband, and other resources that I've acquired along the way. I am ordinary, but doing extraordinary things. So I know there are others on here that have big ideas and big potential for similar successes. So take action, guys. Just do it. Start the business plan. See if it will work. If it won't, get creative and change the plan. Be moldable until it does work. Dig your heels in. Find the resources that you need and do it. It may take months, three years, I don't know. You just got to start. Do it. Your future self will thank you. If you all decide to take action on these ideas, what we are doing will no longer be extraordinary. Taking control of your career may be the norm for athletic trainers, and that will make the world better. Our profession will be better. You've got this. So thank you all for tuning in to this course. Um, I'm overwhelmed with how many of you found me interesting enough to register for the course. And you can reach out to us and we can absolutely send those to you. And we want to just thank you not only for your support with the program, but also for all you do as an athletic trainer. We are all huge advocates of the profession and want to see you succeed. So please reach out if you need anything. And again, thanks for your continued support with um, just the courses that we've put on. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day, and we'll see you soon. And look, uh, look for the um, sorry, look for that uh, continuing education certificate within a week. Every EBP course, you get your certificate within one week. So if it's been a week and you haven't gotten it, that means it's either in your spam folder or um, your uh, firewall is keeping it from coming in. So just reach out. All right, everybody. Thanks again, and have a great day. Thank you, Lamita.